Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Now, it's just possible that this morning's message may not be the most coherent one that that, uh, has been delivered from this pulpit. I have to tell you that meandering around at 13,000 feet does kind of take it out of you. So I'm going to sit here today and do the best that I can. But I've made it sound like that was the reason that we went to go, that we went to Colorado this last week, but it, it wasn't. The main reason for us to go there was to lay to rest my aunt and uncle who had both passed away during COVID, not from COVID, but during COVID, and uh, we had had not had the opportunity to inter them. And so uh, last Wednesday, we all gathered at uh, Pikes Peak National Cemetery, brand new uh, military cemetery in Colorado Springs, um, and had a, a beautiful service for my aunt and uncle. Um, for those of you who have experienced a military service, uh, somehow all the formality and everything that they do is actually quite moving and uh, touching, and they did just a beautiful job. And then we laid my aunt and uncle uh, to rest uh, there in that cemetery. Lots of family came for this. Lots of family. I had no idea who they were. They came from that, the other side of my family, from my aunt and uncle's side of the family. And some of them I'd never met. Some I'd met once before. Um, and it was, it was fantastic, really, honestly. Uh, I took my son and my grandchild, and we were there. And it was just so great to be around all of that family, to reconnect or connect with people I hadn't seen for years. Um, And we all gathered at the family home there in Monument uh, for a celebration of the lives of my aunt and uncle. But it's as we kind of get started on our our theme for this this morning, what we're going to be talking about, I want to give you a sense of that whole story from the point of view of my cousin Terry. Terry is my oldest, uh, my oldest cousin. She's a year younger than my oldest brother. And um, my uncle, her father, passed away in September of 2020. In November of 2020, um, her sister, Lori, my cousin, passed away from breast cancer. Then in the week in which my aunt passed away, a few days before that, her uh, daughter's father-in-law passed away. A couple of days later, her husband passed away, and then, of course, her mother passed away. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? I know people in here have suffered tragedies, and and I'm not trying to make light of those, but my goodness, within 14 months, she lost four of her closest family members. And they were a very tight family, really. Uh, growing up in the military, some of you probably know what I mean by that. Um, how do you deal with that? But I looked around. Uh, Terry was there, of course. And I, I, I looked around. We had probably 40 people there at this family gathering after the service. And I realized that's how you deal with that. She was surrounded by people who loved her, would support her, would drive thousands of miles if they needed to, to help her. Not just one or two people out there. And I I thought about what we had talked about the the two weeks before I left for uh, this trip to Colorado about kind of this, this strength of family. And that for men and women, this idea that this, this family uh, strength has some, you know, it's got some legs on it. It's, it's very real. At times that don't get any realer than when you lose so many people who are close to you. This family thing, it worked. It is, continues to work. Obviously, Terry didn't wake up one morning recovered from this. It will be with her her whole life. But she isn't going to have to walk this path alone. And that was so comforting. So why do we have this kind of gray picture 
up there on the screen. And this rather ominous words, the outsider. I realized as we talked about this strong family idea as a, as a fundamental unit of our biblical worldview, we also need to talk about those folks who are kind of outside of that bubble. Now, you might say, well, you know, the biblical worldview in the Bible, if they're outside, they're outside. But they're really not. If you think about so many stories in the Bible are about people who are outside of that bubble. We heard, for example, this story of Jephthah, right? Hard to pronounce. And there's a lot more to the story than what was read today. In fact, the meat of the story is, is a little bit different than what we talked about today. But nevertheless, nobody likes Jephthah. He's a jerk. But really, they don't like him because he is the son of a prostitute. So he is excluded from society. You cannot participate with us until they need him. Right? And suddenly, in his own outside, weird kind of way, his faithfulness to God is used for God's purposes for God's people. Jephthah really epitomizes the outsider, right? Let's face it, these are the people we don't like. These are the people that we suspect, right? And it isn't just us. I'm not trying to point a finger here per se. Society has done this forever, right? The Israelites were doing it. The Jews do it. Christians do it. I presume Muslims do it. And I mean, this is just this part of being uh, afraid, if you will, of the outsider. And sometimes that might be justified. But how do we make that determination? As people who are following this biblical worldview, we're going to look at the Bible to give us some base, some ground upon which we are going to develop our ethics and our morals and the way we live our life. How do we know what to do? Well, I think I've made it pretty clear that the default of just saying, well, you know, you're kind of outside this, this wonderful bubble we've talked about, so you're just on the outside. Clearly, the Bible does not support that point of view at all. All right? We see it in the story of Jephthah. We've seen it, oh, I don't know, in the story of Judah and Tamar or uh, David's daughter Tamar. Or we see it in the New Testament with the story of Peter. Peter really ought to be an outsider. Don't you think? He denies Christ three times. He does not good things. But what happens? God uses Peter. God will use any tool laying at hand for God's purposes. And it is Peter's faithfulness that brings that to such an astounding success as the early church grows like wildfire. But the early church was was uh, confronted immediately by another idea about the outsider, the Gentiles. Jesus was clearly a Jew. All of his followers were Jews. Jesus occasionally interacted with non-Jews in a way that was the same he interacted with Jews. Jesus was often very critical of the Jewish religious hierarchy. But he was a Jew. So what about all those Gentiles? What about all those Gentiles? They are outsiders. They appear to be outside of the bubble laid down in the Bible because they do not follow the law of Moses in any way. And in the reading that we had this morning, we see Peter finally having to confront this. And if you'll recall from the reading, he has a dream. And in that dream, it... it, it a vision, I really should say, from God. And in that vision, he realizes 
that the Gentiles have been given this gift of God just as much as the Jews, but they don't necessarily have to become Jews in order to enact that vision. It's a huge sea change. It's one that Paul arrives at independently as well. That um, uh, from Romans, there's this passage of, of Paul identifying that the light of God was given to the Gentiles just as much as it was given to the Jews. And therefore, they must be admitted into the bubble, if you will, of Christ. So clearly it is not a requirement to be a Christian that we follow the Mosaic law. And if we don't, we're on the outside. Because the truth of the matter is, if that were the case, none of us would be Christians. All right, there's got to be at least one Mosaic law that you did not follow today, and there were probably a bunch of them. If you stored meat with your milk in the refrigerator, you're out. Okay? So that's not really a very good criteria, but there has to be. We can't ignore the teachings of the Old Testament. We have to take them seriously, but we have to understand what their purpose is and what God's purpose is. And for Christians specifically, when you talk about a Judeo-Christian world and point of view, we really have to kind of give a little emphasis over there on the Christian half of that. What does Christ call us to do with the outsider, the person who just doesn't fit whatever social rules any particular society might have drawn up. And I'm not, I think Christ's answer is different than the answer in the Old Testament, but it contains the same seed of truth, which is this obedience to God, this faith. Okay, so we need to put that in practical terms. How do we work that out? day to day. And we have seen uh, Christians very particularly begin to organize things in the 11th, 12th century with hospitals and charity and ways in which we can reach out to the outsider. But those are based, or, and those are based, on the idea that the outsider really isn't an outsider. It's a beloved child of God that somehow just might be a square peg in a round hole, but is nevertheless a beloved child of God. And that certainly is a great starting place for all of us to take that assumption to start with. But I've looked at, and I'm going to be very honest, I don't, I don't think you should go home and, and write this down in your book and say, this is how Pastor John said this is exactly the way it is. This is more like I think this is a good starting point as we try to understand people outside of that, that bubble, as it, as it were. One is, and of course Martin Luther King very famously said this about skin color, one is to look at the, the actual character of the person. And I think there are three components of that in particular that are worth examining. One is trust, trusting in God. Ooh, when we start with that, we start to realize, well, I could be an outsider because that wobbles sometimes. Maybe it doesn't for you. Am I confessing here? It sometimes wobbles. But there is a connection between being able to give your trust to God, to understand that when we don't understand the world, God does. And that we can live in that trust. Sometimes that's called the fear of God in, in the Old Testament. It means more or less the same, the same thing. And that translates for us in our ability to live in or to work towards living in trust with other people. The people around us. The way we establish relationships. In other words... The way we establish a relationship with God is a way we establish relationships with each other. And of course, trust is a two-way street. We all know that. And so God is easy to trust <laughs> in that sense. 
But nevertheless, it's a good starting point for us. The second attribute, I don't know what we're going to call these things, is um, covenantal faithfulness. In other words, we made, God has made a covenant with us, and we have made a covenant with God. We made that covenant with, through Noah, and we made that covenant again through the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And it's not a covenant we should take lightly. I mean, you might ignore the covenant you made with your HOA, but the covenant we, makes, we make with Christ is a covenant of trusting in God and, and having faith in God. They, they are connected, obviously, but it's a covenantal faithfulness and fidelity, right? I think I don't need to tell anybody here about the importance of fidelity in your day-to-day -day relationships, not just the sexual fidelity of, a, of an intimate relationship, but fidelity in all of your relationships. You do what you say you're going to do because that produces trust, right? And there's some faithfulness that that trust will be carried out because you generated that. You started with that as a place you were going to start with your personal relationship because you're going to start with that as a part of your relationship with God. And... The third component, if uh, you will, with relationships, is monogamy. Wow, that seems rather... I mean, there were people in the Old Testament who had multiple wives. Does that mean Solomon is outside of the bubble, you know? <laughs> well, I'm not going to speak for Solomon, all right? That would be ridiculous. But um, the... First commandment is as plain as day. There is one God. Period. No questions. It's unambiguous. And that monogamy that we exercise in our own relationships, in our closest and most intimate relationships, is the basis of trust and fidelity. When that monogamy is broken all of those other things are broken. Well, certainly um, in our kind of stumbling human way, if that's going to break that, what does that happen with God? When you say, oh, you know, I really like you, God, but there's this other God. Very attractive other God. Come on, you know that's not going to work. And the Bible makes that clear. There's really, un it's very unambiguous about this idea of trust and fidelity moved through monogamy. And certainly, outsiders can do all of those things. Even Jephthah. You know, I'm going to have to preach on the rest of the story of Jephthah for you guys to really understand what I'm saying. But nevertheless, take my word for it this morning. Even for Jephthah, so outside of everything, he is able to be faithful he is able to trust God. He keeps his word to the one God, even though he ends up paying a price, and others in his family pay a price for this. It is God's will, and he follows it. And that is the ultimate. Now, again, I don't know if, again, you can go home and consult your book and then look at someone and say, well, are they faithful? I'm not sure this is the whole story. But it's not a bad starting place, I don't think. It's not a bad way for us to, to say, wait a minute. You know, maybe we can base some of the judgments we make about other people. But start with these three things, you know. Maybe they're trusting God in a way that seems weird to us. But if you break it down, well, there you go. Or they are faithful in a way that we don't understand that. And it doesn't seem right, but there you go. They, you, can, you can see it. And this idea of monogamy, there's faith and trust in their personal relationships as they are working out their faith and trust in their relationship with God. You know, it's okay to say, you know, I don't get that. <laughs> I don't really understand that. But I, I think perhaps maybe God does. <laughs> 
I think we don't have to have a biblical worldview that assumes that there are people who are in and people who are out. That judgment belongs to God. That judgment belongs to God. And so we do the best we can. We do what we can. Let me put it this way. I'm running a little late this morning, so I'll see if I can wrap it up here. Imagine two different scenarios. When you die and go to heaven, and you are met at the pearly gates of heaven. And in one scenario, you come up to, you come up to God at the pearly gates, and you say, you know, God, I, was, I tried really hard to be kind and forgiving and accepting and to really try to see your image in everyone I saw, even though I, I struggled a little bit with some folks, but I really, really tried. And God says, well, buddy, you were wrong, and you're going to hell. Or you come to the pearly gates, and... You meet God and you say, God, I really tried my best to be kind and forgiving and to, and to see that image of God in everyone I met. No matter how weird I thought they were, I really gave it my best shot. And God says, you know, I'm sorry, but for some of those people, you were wrong. But really, thank you for the effort. Let's go have some coffee and I'll explain it to you. That's really what it's all about for us. We're all imperfect. I would hate to do a sermon in front of you in which I gave over all of my sins. It would be the longest sermon you've ever heard. <laughs> but I try, and I encourage everyone here to try, and I know most of you do, to bring that biblical worldview of Knowing that God has a purpose for everyone, sometimes not everyone accepts that purpose or rejects God, but our judgment should be based on our ability to try to bring the light of Christ, to open ourselves to the idea that there is that image of God and that worth given at creation to every single person. And yes, we might fail, we might stumble, we might get it wrong. But we might get it right. We might truly be God's people among all of God's people. Cousin Terry was so blessed to have all those people around her at that time. And I have to tell you, there were probably a couple people there who might be outside that bubble. I don't know. I don't want to talk about my family too much. But, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, every single one of them was within the scope of God's love. And every single one of them deserved that love and respect from us. Amen.